So in this video, I want to walk you guys through some of like the headaches of home buying and how to get around them and to be prepared for them. And you know, what options do you have as a millennial home buyer, right? Because it's not as easy to buy a home now, even if you have the money and the income for the home as it has been in the past in you know, previous generations. And I'm hoping that I can shed some light through experience of my own previously and currently and be able to help you guys kind of navigate this, um, especially if you're a first time home buyer. When you're renting, you're at the mercy of your landlord. Um, but when you own a home, you're now at the mercy of your home. But for, for me, I'd rather be at the mercy of my home, right? Because I know that my money is going towards something that I own and that I'm building equity on. And even if something breaks down, yes, I have to pay into it, but that money is gonna come back to me later on. So that's why I decided that I'm done renting and I'm going to start looking to buy. For a lot of people I know who have generational wealth from their families or have you know some sort of inheritance, it's much simpler and easier to buy a home because they have something to work with. For folks like myself um, and many of you out there who don't have generational wealth, um, who, who've grown up with nothing and have to kind of build everything from nothing, it's a much bigger hill to climb. And I want to make sure that I'm imparting some of my experiences so that you guys can also one day be able to get where I'm at right now and be able to afford to buy yourself a home. It might not be a mansion, it might not be your ideal home, but it's something that you own that can be the generational wealth that you've started to build for yourself and for your family going forward. If you don't have a lot to work with, I would suggest looking at condos first and not looking in the inner cities even. Look further out because whatever you can afford, make sure that it's a good property first of all. Like don't buy just anything, but make sure it's a good investment because even with a condo, you won't get a lot of equity, but you will get something more than you would rent renting. So start small, build equity over the years, and as your career progresses and as you make more money and as your property increases in value, then you can trade up slowly over time. Um, the other option you can do is get something that is maybe a fixer upper. If you can afford a little bit more and get something that is a house, but it's a fixer upper, I always suggest going that route rather than going something brand new, but it's way out of your price point. From my experience, if you're buying an old home that is renovated and updated and basically a flip, the people who've invested in that are gonna want a profit, right? Why would they do this with no profit? Why would they build people free homes, basically? No, they're gonna want a profit. And on average, that profit they're looking for is at least 20%. So let's say that home is a million dollars what you would have paid to buy that home and renovate it yourself would have been closer to about $800,000. But because you're buying it done for you, you're paying basically the investor for their labors, you're paying 20% or more above what it would have cost for you to do it yourself. So be open to that kind of stuff. If you're on a budget, um, be open to putting your own blood, sweat and tears into getting that house into the way you want. So the number one thing you need to do as soon as you're ready to buy a home is go get pre-approved. You need to know what you can afford and then you need to sit down and see if that's actually what you can afford and 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 and, and you know make a pros and cons list, right? Of if I buy this home at this price and this is my mortgage, what do I have to give up in terms of spending power in other areas of my life for recreation or whatever? And so I think the key here is that you have to be really realistic with yourself. Just because you can afford a certain mortgage doesn't mean that you should pay that level of mortgage. Um, the whole rule about, you know, like having certain percentage of debt or that, that, that's out the window door to me because I think that if you are committed to owning your home and willing to sacrifice and spending in other areas to make your home ownership goals reality, then you should do that. I technically need a little bit more time to be able to buy the home that I really want to live in forever, but I also don't want to wait and keep renting because my plan is to also have a permanent home and an investment property. And if I keep waiting, 
I feel that I'm going to give up the opportunity to be able to get into an investment property also. So my plan is to buy the investment property first because prices are only going to go up. They're not going to go down. So I can buy my investment property first and live in it. And then when I'm ready to buy the final home, then I can transition by that home and I have my investment property already and have the equity from this that I can potentially pull out to put as a down payment on the final home also, in case that the price of the final home also goes up. There are a lot of people from other major cities who are selling their properties there and coming to Seattle to be able to buy a better property and throwing cash down on it. Because at the end of the day, salaries in Seattle is comparable to San Francisco and many other major cities in, the, in America. But the cost of living here, though expensive, is still significantly less than the Bay Area. So we're getting a lot of people from the Bay Area who are selling their smaller homes, condos, and coming here and being able to buy like bigger homes with land closer to the city and being able to pay cash for most of it. The previous home buyer that bought our home came from San Francisco. Although I'm still kind of on the fence because if I can afford to buy something that I know I can live in the long run now, I'm totally willing to do that too. So my home search is kind of all over the place. Um, I don't recommend that for you guys. I recommend that you guys figure out what you want and what you can afford at this time and focus on those types of homes and properties. Um, I'm just in a very special circumstance where I'm kind of able to be more flexible. So that's why my home search is less focused than what I would suggest for other people. As we go to the home tours, I'm gonna to give you tips on what to look for when you're looking at homes. It's really important when you buy a home to not be desperate, to not just get in this rat race mindset and feel like, I have to just get this house. There's red flags that I'm ignoring or red flags that I'm not, you know, like making an effort to see. The biggest cost to homeowners is picking a house with a lot of problems and you're already maxed out by the mortgage payments and you don't have the ability to pay for the renovations or correction work that's necessary once you move into that home. I'm not gonna lie to you, my first home that I purchased, um, I trusted that they had the pre-inspection and they had the plumbing inspection, all that stuff. And when we moved in and lived there for a while, um, I realized that a lot of those inspections are just BS, to be honest. Um, a lot of inspectors that you hire have different qualities. Just like when you go and buy a product, there's high quality, low quality, and like a service that you can pay for, there's high high quality service and low quality service. Same thing with inspectors. And um, what I found was that the my pipes, my um, city sewer line was completely jacked up and it cost probably close to $65,000 to correct that. And had I been more adamant about doing my own inspections up front and being more careful and not trusting other people's you know, word, um, I could have avoided myself a lot of costs, right? Because I would have had the seller do that or reimburse me. So that's a key thing that a lot of first time buyers don't pay attention to. Sometimes a home can be renovated and look amazing aesthetically, but there are a lot of problems, um, structural and things like that. And those things are things that you can't fix yourself. You can't go to Home Depot and do your HGTV magic and fix those things yourself. You're gonna have to hire people. And some of that stuff can actually require a lot of time and headaches and effort too, um, requiring a lot of permitting and it could st structurally require more changes than you would be willing to do. So pay attention to things beyond just aesthetics. The aesthetic things you can change, but the structural things are harder. So that should be your main priority and concern when you're looking for a home. I also always recommend that if you're on the lower end of the budget, which is what I would be for this investment property versus my um, final home property, I have a whole different perspective between the two when I'm looking for either of them. So for the lower investment property for me, which may be just what you can afford as your final home for now, um, it's really important to look for a good layout. Find a home that has a layout that you like. 
because it could be an ugly home, the kitchen can be ugly, the bathroom can be ugly, whatever, but you can fix aesthetic things and it's more affordable to fix aesthetic things. You can even do some of it yourself. And in the future, when I do more videos on how to you know, update your homes uh, yourself, you can see that it's not as difficult to fix aesthetic things. So focus on a good layout, good structure, good bones to your home, and then fix aesthetics later. I speak from experience because I've helped many people renovate their homes, family, friends, and I've also built out a few businesses for myself um, and know the cost of certain types of work between aesthetic versus structural, electrical, um, plumbing, etc. So trust me, you want a home that has good bones and it's within your price range in a good area that you want to be in and then fix aesthetic. Don't pick a home that looks gorgeous and beautiful but has a lot of problems because you're going to be in for a nightmare once everything is unraveled and you're gonna have to fix the aesthetic again after you've torn it all down to fix the insides of the homes, right? So don't let aesthetics blind you to problems in the property. Another thing to be wary of as a first-time homeowner is it's really easy to get sucked into the rat race and start increasing your budget and getting into danger zone and being really unhappy later when your house poor and you can't afford to do anything else. Um, why that's a danger is because it's so easy to fall into that trap and it could destroy marriages. It can destroy, you know, like your relationships with other people, even if you're not married, because if you're stressed out financially, you're feeling the burden of this home every day, all the time, you're going to exert that kind of negative energy out to everyone around you. And you're gonna fall into this negative headspace that could destroy your career too. So don't fall trapped to that. If you can't afford a home in, in the means that you can comfortably live, then so be it. Um, don't force yourself to go beyond your means or you'll eventually lose that home anyway. As you go through the home buying process, for some people, it can take two weeks, a week even, a month. For others, it can take months, six months, eight months, a year, two years. Everyone is different. And I think that the pickier you are, the longer it's going to be to, to get the home that you want and in the price range that you want, right? Um, I don't think it's a whether you can afford less or more because there's plenty of, you know, lower price options. But if you're a picky person, that's going to be harder for you, even if you have three, four, five, six million, because at every price point, there's going to be different criteria and a different mindset. And so I always suggest people to make a list of what you absolutely need to have in this home and what you can kind of bypass for now, because it's going to make it much easier to pick your home and not be overly picky and then lose out. So hint, if you're going to need to borrow money from, from people, um, borrow months ahead and keep it in your account because lenders and loan um, officers in the bank will look back about three months, I believe, um, in your history. And anything within those three months, they're going to want to find records and evidence and proof of where it came from and things like that. Anything beyond that, they don't really care where it came from. So note is that if you're going to be getting money from family or borrowing from other sources, get all that wrapped away three months at least beforehand um, so that your escrow process is clean and less problematic. Buying a home also requires picking a great real estate agent. Um, your real estate agent is someone who's gonna really help you a lot and it's really important who you pick. I always say it's hard not to work with a friend, but when it comes to such a major and important decision in your life that could be make or break for you down the road, um, financially, I, I don't think that a good friend would pressure you into picking them if you're uncomfortable. Because when you are trying to buy a high price home, you need a certain level of um, experience in your agent and you need a certain level of tactfulness that a newer agent might not have. Um, if you're buying a low cost home, you're more flexible to work with just anybody, right? But that's also not necessarily true because right now, Lower price homes have high competition, so a very tenured and experienced agent will help you more. So I've worked with multiple agents um, over the course of my life, um, 
both on buying and selling perspective and at high prices and low prices, right? Right now, everyone thinks that, you know, like when you're buying a low price property, it should be easy, any agent will do, right? But actually no, because it's so competitive, you need the best of the best agent to be able to navigate you towards buying your home and dealing with all the competition and having the, the experience to be able to tell you when you should bid up, when you should bid down. You're going to need an agent that has a lot of experience if you're competing in the general market that is in the median price point because there's high levels of competition and you need a lot of strategies and tactfulness in order to win that home. So you need an agent that can give you all those things and has a lot of experience dealing with that level of comp uh, competition and competitiveness. Um, if you're buying an ultra high price um, piece of real estate, you might not need to find someone that's going to be extra good at competition, but you need someone who knows how to navigate that price point and get you the best deal and, you know, concessions at those high prices, which means that you don't always have the same agent for everything you're trying to do. Um, when you're buying, you might have someone that you feel is better for that. Um, or when you're selling, there might be someone who's better at that. Or at high points, low points for pricing and different markets too. And agents also have specialty in different areas of the city. So you need to be aware of your agent and what their specialty is before you select one. There should always be a bid presentation that agents will give you when you're selling your home. But when you're buying, you should also ask for something similar. They should have a presentation package for their background, skill sets, and what they can offer you as a buying agent. So I know I covered quite a bit of stuff in this video and haven't been able to get into the super detailed nitty gritty information on a lot of the topics that we covered. But in future videos, I'll have more time and ability to do that. Um, there's no way that I can cover all that into one concise video for you guys. So make sure to subscribe so you get the pings for the next videos that come up as I progress and develop these topic areas more and show you through my own process of hunting for a home, how things work and what you can avoid when you do go look for your home and hopefully learn some things that you can take away and help you um, become more successful in your home search too. Well, that's all guys. Thanks for joining me today and watching this video. Make sure to sh like, share it, and subscribe, especially those of you who are new so that you can get the pings on upcoming content that I have coming up. Until next time, bye. Make sure that you guys are checking back because in part two, I will be taking you on my home tours and showing you a lot more details and more fun stuff. I know that I spoke a lot in this video and that I didn't get to show you guys a lot of stuff, but it'll be so worth it in the next video. I'll be showing you new construction, existing construction, modern, traditional, everything. Because when I go search for homes, I want all the options. I want to compare everything, big, small, old, new. Only then will you see what all your options are and be able to make the best decision you can possibly make. Through this experience, visually, I can show you all the things that I keep talking about. Where to look for issues, how to look for issues, and what red flags look like and don't look like. So stay tuned and I'll see you in the next video and it'll be a lot more fun, I promise.